First Peter chapter number one. We'll begin down verse number twenty-four. The Bible says, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Now, really two very simple verses, but here the Apostle Peter, throughout really the entire first chapter of the book of Peter, or first Peter, we see that he's encouraging those that have put their faith in Christ to understand that they put their faith not in the words of man, but in the very words of God. I mean, verse number twenty-five tells us, "By the word of the Lord, but the word of the Lord endureth forever." As this is the word which by which the gospel is preached unto you. Where did the gospel come from? It didn't come from man; it came from God. Right? The word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So God's words not only endure forever. Okay, God's words also imparted unto man salvation. So the entire chapter is about, hey, it's not about, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote the same thing. It doesn't matter whether Paul preached to you or Apollos or Timothy or whoever it was that was preaching when you got saved. All that matters is you heard the word of the Lord. Right? Delivered not by man, but delivered by God himself. We're just sharing what it is that God told us. And so he's stressing the importance of understanding in verse number 25 that your faith is not in what Brother Doug preached, right, or what Brother Mike preached or what anybody else has ever preached around here. Your faith is in the fact that this word is alive, that the Holy Ghost, which will lead you and guide you into all truth, is also still alive. And he'll take the word of God and to your heart speak what it is that you need to know. That it was the Holy Ghost that drew you under conviction to God because the Word of God was preached and you received it. But we know that it's not the God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that, that would believe. But what do you preach? The Word. But it's not about preaching man's philosophy. It's not about preach, preaching a one, two, three, repeat after me. Something that man drew up so that you could easily understand it. It's not about preaching what's popular. It's not about preaching what's unpopular. It's about what preaching thus saith the Lord. So, Peter, verse number 25, says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. If God told you, it's impossible for God to lie. That's why his word endures forever. But on top of that, because it endures forever, if God told you it, you can take it to the bank. You can hang your hat on it. As they used to say, you know, that's a check that you can take to the bank in cash. It's always going to be good. All right, well, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Right? It's through preaching that God chose to save man. But how shall they hear without a preacher? But we ought to thank God for the fact that someone was, one, faithful, because God won't put somebody into the ministry that's not faithful. But then after they were called, they submitted, they surrendered to the call of God, and then God used them in your life to preach unto you what it was that you needed to hear, the gospel. If I mean, you ever just really sit down and think, like where you started, and just think of how you got to here. Right? How many different people had to tell you about some person that invited you to church, that invited you on a day that you just happened to be open, and something down here was pricked and said, you know what, I probably should go with that person. You know, I probably should go down to that church. And then when you got here, the Holy Ghost started working in your life because somebody you thought was crazy and spitting and slobbering, especially if Dad was preaching, Right? country or cornbread even though he's from Ohio that don't make sense either right but through all of that God orchestrated that you're here today right? that's far more than coincidence right that's divine 
claiming. That's the providence of God. But when you really start coordinated that preach the God, the word which is preached unto you is the word of God. But that God didn't just give his word for people to preach. God made the way for you to get here to hear what it is that was being preached. Like the providence of God, every time I start trying to wrap my head around it, Brother Ron, it gets away from me. It's bigger than I am. Bigger than any of us. But it'll just make you feel so insignificant that God would think so highly of you. That he would not only make a way for you to hear, but he'd make the path for you to get there in order to hear it. All right, well, verse number 24 is what I want to talk about this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 24, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. Now when I read that first part of this scripture, it brings back the remembrance that Jesus consider the lilies. That one lily arrayed in its beauty out in the field, in the eyes of God, it's far more beautiful it has far more glory than Solomon did in all of his riches and all of his finery. Right, it says that the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The glory of man may be bright. Solomon had a lot of glory in his day. All that glory disappeared when he turned away from God and started doing what was right in his own eyes. But God highly exalted Solomon. God highly exalted David. To this day, people in Israel tell you David's the greatest king they ever had. If it's not David, they usually pick Solomon. But to this day, people remember throughout history, people like George Washington, the founding fathers. Okay, men have attained a lot of glory. But, even though they may have shined really bright in their life, nowadays it's not as glorious. But the glory of man is as the flower of the feet. Flowers are pretty, right? They can get very pretty. But they're not pretty for long. Right? I even pulled some, uh, I don't know how they did it. Right? I know it wasn't witchcraft, but it might have been close to it. But for mom's birthday, I found a place. Because Mother's Day was right around the time too. I found a joint that would take roses and then they'd do something to them to where they're not alive no more but they're not dead and they're going to last longer right like they made mummies out of roses I don't know how they did it but they're still they still look like they're blooming over at mom's house right? you say how they do that I don't know but they say it lasts up to about a year even with the best that we can come up with a flower can only last for a year you stamp it right people used to stamp them in between the pages of a book keep it out of sunlight keep the air away from it you might go back to it. It's still going to be the same color, but it's brittle. It'll crumble real easily. Right? It may still look the same, but it isn't the same. You blow on it too hard, and the whole house of cards is going to come down. Right? Flowers, I don't get it, right? But ladies seem to think that they're pretty cute. Right? But I also understand that part of the beauty, part of the draw is because they don't last for that long. That if it was something that you could have all of the time, right, it wouldn't be that special to you. Consideration. When you're a kid, right, ice cream is the greatest thing in the world the first time that you've ever had it. And for about the next 200 times that you ever have it. But when you get like Brother Tommy and I and you realize you can have ice cream whenever you want it, ice cream's not that special no more. Right, you think, oh, but ice cream back in that day. I can go down and buy like four gallons of it if I wanted to at Kroger. But I don't want ice cream that bad. Right, when you understand that the glory of man, the knowledge of man, all the greatness that God has given man, the ability to perform, when you start really looking at it, you realize, well, that's pretty cool. But it's not, that, not all that special. If you really pay attention, you can find a flower and you can go out and find another one almost exactly like it. Right? Same, 
Same family. That can be the same exact species of flower. But see, you thought you had the only one until you realize that there's a field full of them right over there. Right? A rose is very nice until you realize that he cheaped out and then he could have bought like two dozen of them. Right? Or that that lady has the... Well, that one looks almost the exact same as the one that I got. Yeah, it's because it's a rose. It's pretty. But it's not the only one like it. Right? You didn't get a one of a kind. So when it says that all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass, the grass withereth. Right? We're at that time of year where the leaves are fallen. Okay, we're at the time of year where grass should have started slowing down on the growth cycle. And you shouldn't have to be cutting it like every three days when it starts pouring rain in the summer. Right, it's not growing four inches overnight right now. Okay, if you cut grass, what's it turn into? Hey. Right, you know what people think of hay? They throw it around the floor of the barn. They walk on it. They let animals use it, right, as fodder for their kennel so that they can just scoop it up and throw it out. Hay's not all that important. Grass grows, but grass gets cut down. What do we do with it? Right, we sit on bales of it. Right, you could cut that bale and you can go and throw it out into it but most hay doesn't have seed in it it's not good for going out and trying to grow out in the field no this is the hay that you, cut, you can't even feed it to animals if it doesn't have seeds in it All right, otherwise you're just giving them basically glorified dental floss but there's no su su substance to it All right hay anybody going to stick their hand up and say give me a plate of hay for lunch today no thank you Right. Hay can be useful, but hay's nothing important. You can go without it. You can find a substitute for hay if you really needed to. All right, but then it also says, and the flower thereof falleth away. Right. Everybody hates dandelions, but I'm going to use them as the example. But dandelions that yellowish orange color that they are now you think oh that looks pretty nice until what until they turn into the death star right and it's the white ball of death that when the wind blows you realize that sucker's going all over your yard and because the neighbor has 50,000 of them in his yard yours is going to get carpet bombed right then dandelions aren't your friend but really all that thing did was sprout up grow some leaves, the leaves died the flower thereof and then what happened? The wind blew it away and it happened really quick but that flower is so fragile when it withers away and it's got all that white fuzzball that literally, it doesn't take an animal running by and you know, trampling on it in order to destroy No, it just takes the wind you don't have to go out there and light fire to it in order to destroy it. No, nope, just the wind will blow it away. Right, that's how fragile man is. We forget that. Right, we're so incompetent, we can't even figure out how to keep oxygen in the air if God were to turn it off. Right, we don't even have enough common, well some people don't have enough common sense to believe that the world's round. Right, there's a whole group of people out there to think that the world is still flat. Them people got problems. Right, but why? Because they read something that seemed pretty convincing and then they just believe it. Right, the wisdom of man, what does it do? It grows up, it falls away, wind will blow it away. But every now and then somebody says, now nah, this flower that died just like the rest of every flower, Right, this piece of grass that withered just like every other piece of grass, this piece of grass knew what he was talking about. And didn't want to cling on to it. He said, that's foolish. Yeah, especially when we've got the lily of the valleys. 
right? The rose of Sharon. The one that never dies. The one that in all of his splendor has never had anything compared to him. But yet we want to be stuck over there in the hay bale saying, no, but that piece of grass right there, that was special. Like I said, a flower can be very pretty. But if you're focusing on the flower, you're missing the one that planted the flower. You know why grass is out in the field? Because God put it there. You know why grass grows up? Because God wanted it to. You know why grass passes away? Because man chose to sin. But in God's plan that man should die. The reason that the flower passes away, that the grass withereth, is because Adam and Eve chose to sin in the garden. That's not God's fault. But God made a way that grass could become like his son. We just sang about it this morning. That's a wonderful thing. Well, where are we going with this, Brother Jordan? Huh? Verse number 24, we see the comparison that man, that book of Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun. All of our glory is as filthy rags, the Bible tells us. My righteousness, filthy rags. But he wrote me in his righteousness. But yet there's so many saved people that even though the word of the Lord endureth forever, that we were saved by the gospel right, that was preached out of the word of the Lord, that we know that we're grass, that we wither away. Okay, just when you think that you've got a handle on things, it's like, you know what? I look pretty good today by the time, and then you find out that there's 18 more gray hairs than there were yesterday, and you're thinking, what, what in the world... Where did that come from? How do you think? Well, you know what? I'm feeling pretty good today. I ate good meals today. I'm feeling healthy. Got some exercise. And you look in the mirror, and there's more wrinkles on your face than there were yesterday. Right? There's a way of your flesh humbling you and reminding you, you're just a piece of grass. You were born, and from the moment you were born, you began dying. Okay, but we're just grass. But yet, God chose to take that grass and use it for his honor and his glory. He chose to take some grass, put it in his garden, right? He grafted us into the vine. He made us a part of the true vine, which, if you study your word of God, that's himself. He grafted us into himself so that we could become like him. So knowing all of that, right, why wouldn't everybody, saved, lost, especially saved people here this morning. I know who we're preaching to. Okay, but why would anybody not consider this first? Consider this as the only authority. Why would anybody look anywhere else? That doesn't make any sense to me, Brother Tommy. Now maybe I'm just ignorant or too naive to wrap my head around this. But if the word of man is as dead grass it withers now don't get me wrong there have been a lot of smart people throughout history well why were they smart because God gave them the ability to understand it but even in everything that they've come up with there's a whole lot that they can't explain but it's something that I heard earlier this week right, you all know the game of pool billiards you take one of those pool boats they're very smooth right to the touch well they tell me that if you were to take the globe of the earth and shrink it down to the size of a pool ball that it would be smoother on the surface than any pool ball that's ever been machined by man, by hand, machine however you want to do it by earth the tallest point right, Mount Everest about 14 miles up the deepest point in the ocean is about 12 miles deep and then the, as round as earth is all the thousands of miles it takes to get around the equator it's only 12 down and 14 up the difference 26 26 miles isn't even the distance from here to Josh and Brittany's house but that's all the difference that it is all the way across the face of the planet so if God were to shrink that down to the size of a pool it'd be smoother than anything that man could ever make now you think, well, there's great mountains. Yeah, and there's deep valleys. But in the grand scheme of things, 
We're not as big and we're not as complex as we really think. Right now, when you think about, well, wow, that's weird. All the water, look at that map over there. 70% of the world is covered by water. But the Bible tells me that God portioned out that water just from the crevices in the palm of his hand. Didn't say that he cupped his hand. No, just those little lines that we have in our hands. All of that is the water that filled up the whole earth. God just went. Right? So start thinking. They're not that deep. Right? I'm not made out of clay and rock. You can't get up here and like chisel away at me. Very shallow. But yet that's all the water that's on the face. It says that the earth is his footstool. Right? And I really care about what so-and-so says about the stock market? No. I'd rather trust God. I care about what so-and-so says is going to happen in the next election? No, because I know that no man comes to power or no man falls from power unless God ordains it. I care about a war that's going on on the other side of the world? No. Because I'm in His hand. His hand's in the Father's hand. And no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Which means that by the time it gets to me, it's got to have God's approval twice. And even if it does reach me, the Holy Ghost, being the one that indwells me, is going to be there every step of the way with me. So even if God does allow it to come to my life, He promised that He'd go through it with me. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? It doesn't make sense to me that people care. Now, granted, there's nothing wrong in learning. Right? But you start learning enough and you're going to start talking funny. They thought Paul went mad because they had learned so much. And they started, he was just babbling a whole bunch of nonsense. He said, no, 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 no calm down. I just got a little happy in the spirit. Now, they thought Peter was drunk when he started preaching on the day of Pentecost. Right? What do we say? True wisdom it's simple it's able to be understood truth is what we call it you know what truth is whether you're 150 years old or you was just born yesterday truth is the same thing it's true right? it's infallible it's proven out to be correct if truth can't stand up to scrutiny it wasn't true to start off with That truth, ideally, especially with the truth of the Word of God, it doesn't matter how sophisticated or how simple you are. The Holy Ghost can get you to understand what it is that you need to understand. Right? A little child may not understand all of the intricacies on why it is bad to steal. Okay, they may not understand that somebody else labored and God provided unto them so that they could use what God gave them to go out and obtain that. Right? It was by the providence of God that you have everything that you have today. So really, when it says, thou shalt not steal, what it says is, I'm robbing God's blessings from you and taking them for myself. Right? We don't think about it that way anymore. We don't think about it that in order to rob from you, I have to take what God gave to you away. You know what that says? I know better than God. Now see, we don't think about it like that because then that has to give accountability unto God. We just think, well, no, they stole it. That other person, it was that other person's and then they took it and they don't have the right to take it. No, that's the logic of man. Truth is that God gave it to you and that means that I shouldn't want it. The problem with theft isn't that something was taken. The problem with theft is down here that there's something wrong with me that I would want what God has blessed you with. They, you know, a little child may not understand that, but a child can understand, no, that's his and not yours. If he offers it to you to share it, you can share. But at the end of the day, it's going back home with him because it's his. Now, why do you think people used to engrave their name or their initials into something that they owned? Because it was theirs. 
If they wanted to go out and smash it up against a rock and break it, it was theirs. They could do what they wanted to with it. But, but even a small child can understand that's not yours. But so even as a new Christian, whether you've been saved most of your life or you've been saved a few years, a few months, a few weeks, God has a way to convey to you what it is that you need to know about how to live upright. How to be, in the eyes of God, one of those glorious flowers. God doesn't want you going out there and looking like a briar patch. God doesn't want your life to be thorny. God doesn't want your life to be a cactus. Cactuses, by the way, do sprout flowers, they tell me. But nobody's going out there and looking at them. Why? Because in order to get to one cactus, you've got to walk past a whole bunch of other ones. You're going to get pricked. You're going to walk out of there looking like a porcupine. Nobody wants that. Well, how come so many people that claim to know God, their life looks like a whole bunch of thorny plants that they can't get up close to, that other people try to come in their life and they get pushed back? But said, well, possibly it's because they've put all of their faith in the wisdom of grass and withered flowers. They've put the most important things in their life Right, they don't I can't remember the name of the guy right now, hang on. David Ramsey, right, writes all them financial books, tells you that if you can't afford it, don't go out and buy it. Well that's all well and good until you have to get a house. I don't know people walking around with three hundred grand in their back pocket. Right? That's all well and good until a car that you thought was gonna last you a lifetime didn't last a lifetime. You know what I did when I went out and bought a car? I didn't have cash for it. But you know what I did? I prayed over it. And you know which one that I bought? The one that God said, this is the one. You know what I did with the car before that? Same thing. But did the other one last forever? No, but it lasted long enough. Well, how long? Until God said it shouldn't last no more. He said, Brother Jordan, that's a real simplistic way of... Yeah. Yes, it's simplistic because God designed it that way. When I give all of those big things over to the one that said, cast all your cares upon me because he cares for me, and he cares for you. When he said, take my yoke upon you for my burden is weak, or my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What he said was, I'll pull the things that you can't, and all you've got to handle is what you can. Right, honest, I know, right, we've got home security systems now. And we've got flood detector systems hooked up to it where we got like water pods or whatever. They sit in the house and, oh, hey, something's leaking in the basement. People so worried about, I get it. I'd rather know than not know. But you know what I'd rather put my faith in instead of ADT or Simply Safe, whatever the new ones are nowadays? I'd rather be on good terms with God. Because you know when the basement's going to get wet? When God says it's time to get for it to get wet. You know when the basement's going to stay dry? When God says for it to be dry. I could take all the steps I want to in order to hedge my bets, but there's just one problem. God's ways are above my ways. If God says it's going to happen, there's nothing I can do that says it's going to stop it. But I truly remember back when I was in high school, it was when the housing bubble burst in 2008. I remember a girl that I know that is, I mean, she ended up okay. She's a teacher. Now she teaches at the same high school we went to. But I remember her coming into school one day, just, you could just see something. Was, she was always bubbly. She's happy. She was the weird one, right? She was the one that was always in a good mood. I don't understand people like that. But she was always funny. I remember her walking in, and we're like, Emily, what's wrong? She says, My parents had a college fund that they told me I could go to college wherever I wanted to and in one day is gone she never had to think about scholarships she didn't have to think about how she was going to afford books her family wasn't well up but they saved up starting at a long time before that and they watched it climb and climb on the stock market and then in one day is gone she still went to college I can't be a teacher without going to college 
Although sometimes I think people that don't go to college should be teachers because they know more than the people that went to college, but that's a whole different lesson. But we don't know what a day brings forth. We don't know our down sitting and our uprising. We don't know how far things are going to go in the world. But I do know the one that holds everything in order. I do know the one that tells water you can't go past this line and it doesn't go past that line. I know the one that told the sun to rise this morning and he's going to tell it later to go back down. You say, but Brother Jordan, the sun doesn't go up and go back down. Yeah, it does. You say, no, we spin around it. No, it, it does. It goes up and it goes down. You know how I know that? Because one day Joshua was out in the middle of the field fighting, leading the Israelites against their enemies. And God held the sun in the sky for three hours. It stayed daylight three more hours than it was supposed to that day. You know why that happened? It wasn't because God just stopped everything from spinning around. No, God told the sun, stay right there. And it did. Scientists will tell you that that's not possible. But by faith, I believe that God did it. Now, if I know a God that can do that, don't you think that I'd appreciate it when he said, you know what you need in your life? We can go back up just a few verses in this chapter and we'll find it. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's what God said my life needed to be. Now, I'm not an idiot. But I believe that you should take advantage of what the Lord has blessed us with. But we live in a country, still believe it's the greatest one on the earth. Not as great as it used to be, but still greater than any place else I know. Right? But I do know that in our society, we've got these things called retirement funds and mutual wealth plans. Now, I'm not saying take all your money out of your retirement account. If God told you to put it in there, don't take it out. If God tells you to take it out, don't leave it in there. All I'm saying is that if you did it and God didn't tell you to do it, why'd you do it? Now, I don't have to go out and pray every day on whether it's right or not for me to go out and rob banks. I've used that experience or that example before. I don't wake up and pray, the Lord, is today the day that I can hit the bank vault? Because I already know the answer to that one. I don't have to ask God if it's okay to you know, indulge in the lust of the eyes or the lust of the flesh or the pride of life. No, that's sin. That's wrong. Right? The wisdom of a man will tell you you can dabble in whatever you want. We're past that. No. What God say? Be ye holy for I am holy. I know what's holy and I know what's not holy. You know what's holy? Things that are like God. You know what's not holy? Things that aren't like God. That's truth. That's boiled down to real simple this morning. Why? Because the truths of God are easy to understand. You know why he said to be holy? Because he's holy. He doesn't tell us to be holy because he wants us to be something that's irrelevant. No, he wants us to be like him. That's why he saved us, so that we could be conformed and converted into the image of his son. And one day, whether we go by the grave or we go by the rapture, I'm going to look exactly like him when I see him. I believe that. So if he's already got all that planned out, don't you think that he should have not only my pocketbook, but my calendar? He should have my daily breakdown of what I think I need to do that day. That when it comes to financial advice, I don't know why I turn on MSNBC or whatever other channel you might look at. Right, Lord, I know you own the cattle on the thousand hill, the gold that's all in the hill. I know that one time Jesus needed money to pay taxes for him and all of his disciples, and it showed up in a fish. I'm not talking about a wallet made out of fish scales. I'm talking Jesus caught a fish. They opened the fish up, and there was money in it. And then they probably would have ate the fish too. Right? Because God not just blessed them with the money, blessed them with the fish too. That's food. What are you saying? If God can cause money to get into a living fish, and then however it was cause that fish to get to Jesus, he can more than take care of me. Right? I do find... That God not only takes care of his people, he promised to meet our needs, but he also promised, which again, 
His word endures forever. In fact, he thinks so much of his word, he exalted it above his very name. He's forever preserved it, the Bible tells us, in heaven. And there's a half that hadn't been told yet. God thinks so highly of his word that he not only promised you that he would meet your needs, he promised that if you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, all these things will be added unto you. You know what things are? Things are something you don't need, but things are something that God knows is going to cause you to enjoy life. He said that you'd have the desires of your heart. But what was the caveat? That you had to first exalt, acknowledge, and recognize Christ as supreme and the ruler of your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And all these things will be added unto you. You know what things are? Things aren't things that go vroom vroom. Things aren't things that glitter in the light. Although most of us got them things. Things ain't even a house. The Bible said having food and raiment to be content therewith. Things are th things that make life easier. Things are things that make life more enjoyable. God didn't promise that you'd have any friends. He promised that you'd be he'd be the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He promised that you'd have him. But if you've got any friends, it's because God gave you things. You say, well, those are people. They're not things. But God allowed them to be a part of your life. You know what things are? Washing machines. Now, granted, I barely know how to use one. I do know how to avoid the clothes all becoming the same color when you take them out. Right? I don't have a red shirt and then a white shirt that goes into the washer. They both come out pink. Right? I know how to avoid that. But... I do read that there's a time that they didn't exist. They's happy to have a washboard and a tub. Then they had to have the crank rollers, right? That they'd squeeze you out all the water. Well, then what'd you have to do? You still had to hang it up to dry it. And how long it take? As long as it took. If God sent a wind, it may dry a little bit quicker, but if God didn't, it's going to take as long as God wanted it to. But what they had before that? Rivers. Right? Things that we don't think we take for granted every day. But if God blessed you with it and something goes wrong with it, why wouldn't you ask the one that gave it to you what you should do with it? Just asking questions. If God gave you... I mean, this is why I don't understand people that have a problem with tithing. We weren't even supposed to talk about tithing, but I just thought about it. If God gave you 100% of what you have, and then God says, but 10% of that's mine. You know what that is? That's not God robbing you. That's us being submissive. You know why God deserves 10%? Because all of it's His. But He asked for 10 he said, 10 belongs to me. But then I also find that we're supposed to give offerings. You know what that is? That's above 10. Well, how much is that? God will tell you. But if God owns all of it, and he's the one that gave it to you, why would you have a problem giving God what God says to give? I don't understand that. Because see, if he gave me all of it and I don't give it to him, but he will give what he does, belongs to him. That's what tithe means. God already owns it. He just wants me to be faithful and obedient to give it to him. Right? But, if God owned all of it, why would I do contrary to what the one that gave it to me said to do with it? Because if I don't give God what belongs to God, I cannot expect another handout. Oh, I may still have a paycheck coming in the mail, but there's going to be a whole lot more expenses than I thought this month. There's going to be a whole lot more that I have to deal with. Why? Because that money that you've got, that's just a thing. 
You think it's life and blood, and you think that it's what makes the world turn. Well, that's what makes the world turn, but it's not what makes heaven turn. You know what makes heaven turn? The power of God. You know what makes the earth really turn? The power of God. So why would I have a problem giving unto God what God says is His? Why would I have a problem saying, Lord, this don't make sense to me, but you said to do it, so I'm going to do it. Faith takes a lot of effort. Especially when the whole world and everything that man has ever written says, that's not the right way to do it. Well, but it's the way that God said to do it. Because God uses the base things that confound the wise. God takes the intellect of man and makes it look stupid. You know how he does that? By doing things out of the ordinary. So the next time that the Spirit says, do it this way. Next time that you're sitting in church and God says, I know that this is uncomfortable, but this is what you need to do. Don't listen to the wisdom of the withered grass. Don't go ask the hay what it thinks. Right? Look unto the lily of the valleys, the rose of Sharon, the one that God planted way back in the beginning, and he's never had one petal fall off. He's never withered in the slightest. He's just as powerful today as he ever was. Don't ask the grass. Don't ask the flower out in the field because it's going to be gone before you know it. Ask the one that is the Alpha and the Omega. Ask the one that promised that if any man asked of the Lord, he'd give unto all men liberally, referring to wisdom. If you want to know, God will tell you if you really desire it. And if you desire it so that you can be right with God and enjoy the fellowship that God desires you to have with Him, God won't withhold it. But the caveat, if God tells you, you ought to do it. Because if you don't, God may not tell you next time. We are greatly blessed, but we are greatly accountable for what we've been blessed with. Why would I take what God gave me and then use it the way that the world tells me to use it? Why would I receive the blessing, the choice of blessings of God? Pressed down, shaking, and bubbling over. And why would I waste it according to what the world says is the right way to do it? Or the best way to do it? Now, I do know that the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. If you invest in a good business and it grows, you're going to get money out of it. You know why that happens? Because that's the way God set up the universe. You reap what you sow. If you labor hard, you're going to be rewarded well. But right? if you invest well, you're going to reap well. But I also know that God said sometimes, instead of putting it in that one that don't make sense, invest in this. You ever had somebody that deep down God told you to go witness to him and you said there's no sense investing in that person? Only for God to prove you're wrong. And for that person to not only get gloriously saved, God, because of the way that he is, he ends up making you all best friends. Now you can't imagine a day that the two of you weren't walking next to each other down this road called straight. All the things that we think God's trying to do, we can't figure it out. We started off by saying the providence of God that he allowed it for you to be here today. You think about all the things throughout history that God had to co coordinate just for you to be here today. Your ancestors had to come to this country and not a different one. Right? Your parents had to move to the town that it was that you moved through. The events of your life had to transpire to where it was that you were here today. Now multiply that times everybody in this room. God's got it all in control. His word is everlasting. You know, that means it lasts forever. When God said it, he never intended to take it back because it was everlasting. When he said, let there be light, there was light. And God never intended for the light to be shut out. When he made the earth, he didn't intend on destroying it with fire. He made it so that it would be last. It'd just be everlasting. You know why he made man? To be everlasting. So you know why God tells you to do something in your life so that it will have everlasting implications on either you or somebody in your life? What do I do 
may not amount to more than a pile of dust over in the corner, wood, hay, and stubble, consumed with a fervent heat. The best that I can figure out what I'm supposed to do ain't going to be enough because the arm of flesh will fail me. But you know what will be enough? What God said to do. And by faith doing it. And just when I start to doubt him, I remember he never been wrong yet. He's never told someone to do it for their hurt, but for their betterment. And he's never led someone astray. In fact, he calls to those that are astray, that are weak, that are needy. And what's he say? He says, come unto me. He promised that anything we commit unto him, he would keep against that day. What's that day? The day of destruction. The day of God's wrath. He said, I'll keep it until all things end. And you know what he'll do? He'll give it right back to you the same way that it was. No man can pluck me out of his hand. No man can pluck anything that I entrust to him out of his hand. So why do we listen to the grass? I'm not taking a stethoscope out there asking the grass what I'm supposed to be doing today. I'm not asking the flowers today what I should be doing. You say, well, that'd be silly, Brother Jordan. Yeah. It's also as silly to ask somebody that's just like I am, conceived in sin, born in sin, sinner by practice, sinner by trade, to ask them what would be best for my life. They don't know. Even if they're saved, if they do know, you know where they got it from? The wisdom of God. You say it's pretty silly to ask the grass its opinion. Yeah, and it's just as silly to ask anybody but God what you should be doing in your life. He created you. He knows you. He has promised to be with you every step of the way. I'd rather listen to him. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.